The details of the execution are told by a witness to the execution. That final night was a blur for me, while Bundy talked with his last visitors at FSP, I returned to my motel for an evening of telephone calls, visits from prison staff, and a wake-up call at 3 a.m. on the morning of January 24 from the best western night clerk. I drove through the gates at FSP just before 4 a.m., went to Barton's office and was invited to join staff for a breakfast of sausage, eggs, grits and orange juice before we started the day's work. I wasn't hungry yet, so I downed a juice and a cup of coffee and started fielding calls. It was about this time that Bundy was offered his last meal, the traditional steak and eggs. He didn't eat it. Shortly after 5 a.m. the head classification officer, I think it was Dave Lear, joined me. We picked up a dozen newsmen and women in a DC van and took them to the prison for secure processing and a final briefing on what they were about to see. About a quarter before seven, we led them into the witness room adjoining the execution chamber, where they squeezed into the few remaining seats. The ten official witnesses had already been seated in the front of the room, directly facing the electric chair. I remember the look on Bundy's face as he was escorted to the well-worn oak chair, his head shaved clean, his steps faltering, and his eyes looking more desperate than they had the day before. They seemed to be searching in vain for a way out where there was none. I wonder how many of his victims had that same look. I don't recall his last words, just the look. At 7 a.m. Barton nodded to the executioner and Bundy's back arched tight against the wood chair as the hum of the transformer kicked in. Ten minutes later, we were walking out to the drive behind the prison, where a reporter, I think it was Ron Word of the Associated Press, waved a flag to tell the others it was complete. The sun was rising but not enough to warm the chill of late January in North Florida. More than 100 reporters greeted me in the press area across from the prison, and I briefed them on what had transpired. Along the way, we saw hundreds of spectators who had come to be close to the execution. I understood the interest and the emotion who had not been touched by the plight of all the victims. But parts of it looked more like a crowd assembled for a circus side show, with spectators yelling and waving banners like Fry Bundy and Let's Fire Up Old Sparky. It seemed out of control. And then it was time to go back to the prison for more press calls. Before noon, Barton approached me with a sealed manila envelope and asked if I could drop it by the governor's office when I returned to Tallahassee. I said sure, tucked it into my black briefcase and headed for home shortly after. I later learned that the envelope contained some of Bundy's last recorded words. Barton had expected Bundy to try talking his way out of this. As Bundy was being readied for his walk to the chair, he had offered to tell about more killings, more bodies, and where they could find them, if only they would give him a little more time. Barton reached into his pocket, switched on the tape recorder, and said something like, OK, talk. You've got 15 minutes. With clockwork-like precision, Barton never missed a beat.